Okay, now the opening session is uh, come to the end, and uh, we will move to the first plenary session. Um, so we will take out the podium and prepare for the first plenary. Thank you very much for joining us. Ah, okay. Ah, doc, uh, sorry, in the beginning of the plenary session, we have a small talk with Ambassador Pake of European Union. And uh, I am very much delighted to invite him for the initial statement. Ambassador, please take the podium. Very good. Thank you very much. So we'll, I will share a few considerations for the next uh, eight to ten minutes, and then I'm very much looking forward uh, to also have a, a discussion uh, with our distinguished uh, chair. I think I, I, the, the, the concept of moving from global warning, warming to global boiling is, I think, quite interesting. Uh, what really, I think, drives the analysis in Europe is also very much science and uh, the most recent IPCC uh, report. And I think, uh, to an extent, we have uh, a change of era where we were with science uh, at a moment where we had global warning. Science has told us for decades now uh, that action was necessary to an IPCC report, which is not about warning anymore, but about warming, with a very clear sense that we are uh, running out of time. Uh, the IPCC uh, report, uh, and we were all part of the process to elaborate uh, that remarkable report, tells us that we need to peak in terms of emissions, uh, not in 2050, but in 2025, tomorrow, we need to peak in terms of CO2 emissions and reduce those by 43% by 2030 if we are to keep uh, the 1.5 degree objective, which is, of course, uh, 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 the objective of an international agreement, but that is not what is important. What we see today is the massive uh, disruptions noted just now uh, by, by our astronaut at 1.2 degrees. 1.5 degrees is already, I think, for our planet, and not so much for our planet, but our societies, particularly the most exposed part of societies around the globe, an absolute disaster. So we, we have that very clear analysis that global warming is uh, now uh, happening, and action is not for 2050. Action needs to take place now. I came across um, The Economist uh, last week, so I think a pretty serious uh, economic uh, newspaper, which I'm sure many of you read. And their lead um, uh, cartoon is my, is my PowerPoint presentation of today. So that is uh, what we need to do about climate change, the ferocity with which the world's nations need to address climate change, again, based on the science I just uh, noted. And um, to be very honest, uh, and I think this cartoon is uh, spot on, what is happening is this, what nations are doing today. And I think there are very legitimate and good reasons for that. I think what uh, the policy of uh, adapting and of course of mitigating, and of course today also adapting to climate change biodiversity loss, environmental degradation is very deeply connected to us. It is a particularly difficult uh, policy issue to tackle. All of you are involved in it and know it very well. Trade-offs are inevitable. Disruption, in particular with the timelines which are now ahead of us, are inevitable. And the challenge is, of course, very much that um, the costs and benefits of acting now, and I think the macro cost of uh, climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation is extraordinarily clear. If we act now, the cost will be up to 10 times less than the cost of non-action. But obviously, these costs are unevenly distributed and also over time distributed very differently. So this is um, a, a broad policy challenge of a fully systemic nature, which is obviously particularly difficult to tackle for all of us. 
Now, Tanakasan asked me to say a few words on, on how Europe uh, uh, tried or tries or is addressing that policy challenge with um, progress uh, certainly happening, and what explains the capacity in Europe confronted to the same trade-offs, to the same disruption as anyone else, uh, has been able to deal with them. So where is the innovation in policy making, if you want? I think the first thing to underline is that uh, we have indeed now at EU level uh, uh, legislation, a climate law in place, which uh, obliges um, all actors, politicians, administrations, economic operators, local governments, all of us, uh, which obliges us towards a goal of 55% reduction of CO2 by 2030. So a very tall ambition and one fixed in legislation. And from that legislation, there is therefore an obligation for public policy and action to conform to the credibility of that objective. So we have, under the European Green Deal, in the last uh, two or three years, ca we came forward with um, very challenging and very ambitious legislation on transport, on energy, on agriculture, in all aspects of this systemic public policy uh, challenge. So I think the first, I think, uh, element of uh, Europe's approach is this hard legal target. I think, of course, it is important to underline that this is something which is not new. Uh, we've been at it now for at least 20 years, and uh, we had uh, already at the beginning of the century a first uh, legal target on uh, renewable energies, energy efficiency, and CO2 reduction of 20% renewable energy, 20% energy efficiency, and 20% CO2 reduction. And in fact, um, if you take the 1990 baseline, Europe reduced its CO2 emissions by 25%, whilst growing by 60%. So this very significant and visible decoupling uh, has indeed uh, taken place. A number of uh, instruments were deployed for that, and I think the most well-known one and probably the most effective one is a market-based instrument besides regulation, which is the emission trading system, putting a price on carbon with regular reviews, with a less and less allocation of free emission and therefore an increasing cost of the uh, um, emission certificates and with that uh, increasingly a uh, a clear price put on, on carbon emissions by industries, leading with that energy efficiency and technological innovation. In the last cycle now, uh, we have also put a cap on the emissions, which will further uh, oblige uh, economic actors, again, in line with the overall objective set, uh, to reduce uh, their emissions and therefore radically, in some cases, change the way they operate. This explains why uh, at um, EU level uh, in member states uh, we now have a, a, an extraordinarily spectacular, frankly, drive towards the renewable energy deployment and why we have, and I must say Professor Shen's um, presentation at the outset was absolutely uh, remarkable and, and I think really, uh, uh, for me, um, uh, really mind-opening as well on some, some aspects. But this is why in Europe, green hydrogen is the way forward um, so that we can indeed, within that carbon pricing system, uh, continue uh, to work within the increasing constraints uh, set by the system. So the question is, uh, why do we do that? Why do we put these constraints uh, on our industry? Uh, why do we accept uh, these uh, trade-offs over time? Uh, and why uh, do, um, uh, do pub does public opinion and economic actors abide by them and support them? I think the, there are, of course, uh, very many different uh, socio-political uh, reasons which probably are at play as well, and cultural uh, in part too. But I think what I would like to underline is um, that public policy at EU level is done uh, very strongly on an evidence base. So when public policies are prepared, they are prepared on the basis of scientific knowledge, technical data, and are then subjected to very robust consultation processes which allow both the industry, 
with its constraints, which are obviously a key dimension of policy formation. We need to take it into account. We need our industries to remain uh, uh, relevant economic growth and uh, prosperity factors. They are part of the discussion. But on an equal footing, so to say, you have all other actors, local governments, uh, citizens, NGOs, including green activists, are all part of the process which then allows the European Commission to make a regulatory proposal. They are therefore often well aligned uh, with this dilemma, cuts across the dilemma, and are then also well aligned with the signs requiring this disruptive, ambitious action. Of course, this is just the start of the policy making. Then um, ministers meet to agree on uh, those um, frameworks, uh, legal obligations, uh, investment choices, uh, policy ambitions. And that is, of course, uh, always uh, a very, very intense discussion. And you will read, uh, including here in Tokyo, I read it every day, how complicated and sometimes um, politically very difficult it can be to make such, such decisions. But this is a process where you have on the one hand ministers, on the other hand the European Parliament, they are on par to agree on legislation, they need to co-legislate. In the Parliament um, you have uh, today a majority out of the 2019 elections, which is uh, still today very much in support of that uh, climate disruptive policy framework. And ministers, on the other hand, come from member states which carry the same objectives. It comes, they also come from member states which are more constrained. And the process, therefore, is about from the proposal, which is already a balance, an ambitious one, but a balance, there is then a process of negotiation where qualified majority allows a fluid process which takes into account the very diverse situation of member states, but nevertheless, in all cases so far, managed to keep the longer term uh, ambition of the legislation. So that's, I think, by and large, um, how this has been uh, done in Europe so far. So I think what is important, and I finish with that to say, is that whilst we are in a, in a good place today uh, against the science and the expectation uh, from the IPCC report, the trajectory seen from today get us to 55, maybe even 57% of CO2 reductions by 2030. So that's very, very significant. Uh, this, is, uh, this remains politically extremely difficult also in Europe. Uh, the social, um, microeconomic, and social uh, impact of these disruptive changes are very visible uh, in Europe as well. You had political pushback uh, in some sectors or in some member states, and that, of course, is and needs to be uh, taken into account. Uh, but the process uh, remains uh, constructed in such a way that we put a lot of political capital in bringing everyone on board, uh, including with, of course, um, uh, social funding and um, transition uh, programs very much aimed at those parts of Europe uh, which are most impacted by this uh, deep transformation. So a number of um, policy elements which are being deployed and which um, give us uh, genuine momentum. This is all probably seen from a European point of view uh, challenging and, and positive. But of course, uh, what is, I think, much more important is that uh, climate policies, energy transformation is happening globally. They are obviously good news, including here in Japan. But that is, I think, really the challenge. We represent a fraction of the emissions. But uh, I believe, and that's what I'm trying to put across this morning, that they are innovative policy design frameworks which have been tested and work in Europe, which can uh, be relevant um, maybe for inspiration beyond it. But maybe even more important is also, and I finish with that, the notion that whilst Europe is acting on science, we are also acting, honestly, largely in self-interest. Because we believe that by drawing um, this policy framework and acting on this energy and climate transformation, we will with that bring about a clean technology transformation 
uh, which will then uh, in turn uh, equip Europe uh, in particular European industries for the competitiveness of the next years and next decades. So Europe's Green Deal is also not, it's, or rather, Europe's Green Deal is very much Europe's climate and environmental policy, but it's, it's also conceived and rolled out very much as Europe's growth policy. And that, I think, is also a one uh, element which I think can be of inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, please take a seat and uh, let me ask one or two uh, questions to the ambassador. Um, your presentation and, 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 and the slides are very, very interesting. I mean, I mean, we need a ferocious lion. Instead, we have uh, cats shouting and crying. Um, Europe is a very interesting case that you have 28 cats or 30 cats and try to make it the one lion to, to solidify and consolidate the differences and diversities into one voice through the process in Vera, uh, Brussels. That is really interesting model for governance in, in many areas. Uh, uh, the Europe is leading in terms of the uh, 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 taxonomy for the climate, uh, sustainable investment, so for the uh, hydrogen, natural gas, nuclear, you name it. it, it you are providing the very good important standard for the climate change mitigation. But sometimes uh, there are conflicts <laughs> with different countries, with the US, with Japan, or with China. So what is that kind of policy of accommodating to, of Europe, of ac accommodating the difference of the views from the other trading partners or alliances? What, what, how to do that? I mean, you are doing very well inside Europe. How can you do that with other countries than Europe? <laughs> Well, I think that is indeed a, a, a key dimension, and Europe's climate policy is also very much about uh, international cooperation. Uh, we, we try to be uh, a force for progress um, in every COP, and this will be again the case in COP28 in a few weeks' time. Uh, the European uh, Union is uh, proposing uh, to its partners, we are discussing it here in Tokyo as well, a pledge for COP28 of uh, the world uh, tripling its deployment of renewable energies. And I think uh, Professor Shen was very strong on that. Huh? It is about renewable energies. Of course, uh, we, we will uh, see a transition out of fossil fuels, which can be uh, more or less uh, rapid, depending on the pathway chosen. But um, the way forward from science, from this great presentation, but also from the policy framework in Europe, is about renewable energy. I think there is, uh, at this stage, uh, certainly no um, conceptual alternative. And this is why we, we recommend this um, objective of tripling of renewable energy, which is also economically, uh, today, a particularly credible perspective. This brings me to, uh, indeed, another uh, element of cooperation is to work with partners um, in trade. I think uh, the world trade um, uh, system is extraordinarily important for, for climate mitigation. We need to ensure that these technologies become available, but also that, um, and that's of course a completely new discussion of the last year and a half or two years, to ensure that the supply chains of these uh, clean technologies uh, remain available for the multiplication of deployment ambition. So rare earths, uh, solar supply chains um, are, uh, from that point of view, more important than ever. And so uh, the European Union is, on the one hand, uh, putting in place a framework to become itself, again, in a position to uh, produce these uh, technologies. We will um, uh, team up with partners uh, around the world on mining and processing. Uh, and we will, we hope with that, be able to uh, make the supply chains for European deployment more uh, robust. But the same goes for Japan. And we also want to work uh, uh, with Japan uh, and with others. Uh, we are, I think, working with like-minded partners uh, in the G7, but also in the G20 uh, and beyond, uh, to ensure that um, these critical technologies, their supply chain, 
are upgraded so that we can collectively indeed accelerate the deployment of renewable energy. Yeah, I think uh, critical uh, minerals uh, supply chains, are, these are the very, very substantial issue to make the decarbonized community. So, I mean, cooperation between Japan and EU should be, should happen as much as possible. In, 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 you mentioned about the World Trade Organization, which is now in, in the jeopardy of, of functioning properly. Do you think that uh, to, to, to make the kind of international governance for the climate and energy, do we need some kind of new entity or new world organization for climate uh, change or energy at the same time? I don't know. <laughs> it's a very honest reply. Uh, I think that we need robust uh, global governance is absolutely clear. Uh, I think the International um, Energy Agency is providing quite a bit of that leadership. Of course, it's leadership which is uh, uh, analytical more than it is executive uh, by function, but it is nevertheless, as you well know, uh, a really important uh, part of it. I also observe that um, uh, the United Nations is, of course, uh, with the Sus Sustainable Development Goals uh, session and the Climate Summit uh, during the General Assembly very much leading, again, with the limits of the UN system, which uh, became so apparent uh, with the Russian war of aggression uh, on Ukraine. But still, I think we have leadership uh, which is happening here. We have uh, certainly also um, promising leadership um, in the context of the multi a lateral development bank uh, system reform, which is being discussed now, including uh, in the World Bank, but also in regional banks. The European Investment Bank, for example, on the European Union side, is um, massively increasing its uh, portfolio of uh, loans beyond the European Union with guarantee facilities to make them uh, effective. And the European Investment Bank uh, has moved um, out of fossil fuels uh, in mm -hmm. terms of energy policy. Uh, so from that point of view, plays also a, a leading role um, amongst financial institutions. And then last, you have obviously uh, the governance of um, uh, conferences of parties. The Montreal um, Biodiversity uh, Agreement of last year was rather remarkable when you look at it in detail. Huh? The targets set make a lot of sense. There's a clear monitoring uh, which I think is going to come back and bite, at least I hope, at some point. It will show how much is done and not done, and that will certainly be relevant in the next uh, few years. And it also has, of course, um, uh, financial pledges. And maybe I finish with that point, because you mentioned the taxonomy, um, uh, which I think is an important point. I think the leadership um, needs to be collective also on, um, on financial uh, flows, uh, both public ones, obviously. I think on the European Union, we are the main contributor to climate finance, uh, be it the European level budget or our member states. Uh, and um, we will no doubt um, in Dubai continue uh, to be uh, uh, ambitious in providing the necessary uh, funding of a public nature, linked very much obviously also to the multi multilateral development bank uh, system capacity to act with leverage which is significant. But as important is indeed uh, financial flows, mm -hmm. and this um, has the dimension of, uh, of some financial flows um, going into legacy industries because of fiscal frameworks or subsidies. We still subsidize uh, massively fossil fuels everywhere in the world, including in Europe, uh, sometimes for social reasons uh, as well. Uh, so there is here certainly um, a, a review which is needed, including on taxation. That's a debate which is happening uh, right now in Europe. And then uh, help uh, investors, financial institutions, bank, to progressively focus uh, their portfolios on green investments. And this is where the EU taxonomy, which you mentioned, comes in. It's now in place. Um, it provides, here again, an analytical framework of reference for everyone across the world. There are different pathways uh, for it. Um, not everyone does it with such a strict taxonomy, but it is, uh, including there's an international forum, really inspiring many. Mm -hmm. I discussed it um, this week, and I finish maybe with that. I think uh, what is often discussed on, on climate policy are, are costs and risk and disruption for established industries, and that is at play, no doubt about that. 
But I think what uh, the investors are also now increasingly seeing is the, the risk for their own investments. The insurance business is very well aware of that, uh, obviously, but other investors increasingly as well. And there's one risk which is now more and more uh, in the minds of, um, of uh, actors economically. It's not the environmental risk, it's not the floods or the fires which claim so many lives and have claimed so many lives uh, just now. It is the legal risk. You have now this legal process in California against the fossil fuel industry. You have six young Portuguese in Europe which brought the case to the Human Court of Human Rights. These are the two most high profile examples, but they're being multiplied. And given that legislation increasingly exists at national level, or at a multinational or global level, this in turn provides very strong legal ground for such claims. So we will, I think, if you take all these elements and investors are very good at taking systemic looks, they don't always get it right, huh? but they are very good at, at scanning and taking systemic looks, I think we will see with that also uh, a continued acceleration with bumps, obviously, but a continued acceleration in what makes economic sense, which is largely these climate, particularly these renewable energy investments. Thank you very much. Japan is also doing the subsidy on, on the fossil fuel. So in facing, I mean, doing, and at the same time, going into that carbon pricing, this is kind of ridiculous way of achieving that. <laughs> it's very efficient and you are working on it here in Japan, which I, is a, of course a particularly good development of the last year. Yeah. We have, maybe if, I, I didn't mention that, you, you alluded to it and it's not such a good conclusion, but an important point nevertheless to note. We have now three days ago, on the 1st of October, the European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism entered into force. And this is essentially about um, uh, a levy at the, at the entry of the European Union uh, for products uh, in a limited number of sectors, I think seven at the outset, steel or aluminium, for example, uh, which, don't, uh, which are not subject to car a carbon pricing framework at home. So which, if you want benefit from uh, uh, indirect unfair subsidy against uh, European products, but also against these climate policies. So the carbon border adjustment mechanism is, if you, if you want, also an instrument of international dialogue. Uh, and we have uh, ensured that it doesn't, it enters into force now, but it opens a period of nearly three years where we will work with partners everywhere yeah. uh, to um, discuss uh, the way they look at carbon pricing, the timelines of their carbon pricing, the mechanisms, we are of course very open on alternative ways of doing carbon pricing. The ETS in Europe is one way of doing it, it's not the only way. And I think there will be many cases where indeed uh, carbon pricing will be accelerated and where then eventually the carbon border adjustment me mechanism or that levy will not need to be applied when it starts in 2026. I mean, I was given yesterday one example uh, of um, energy uh, and climate colleagues who were working um, in, Th in Thailand uh, some, some years ago, and, and they were looking at carbon pricing. And they were told, don't bother, this is not relevant in the policy mix here. Today, carbon pricing is very much part of the conversation uh, as well. Uh, and I think uh, developments, including the one around um, uh, ETS and SEBAM, play a role in that. And I think that's good climate diplomacy as well. Thank you very much, Ambassador. You, ha you gave us a lot of interesting insights and uh, from the experience uh, in Europe and what ISEF can do. Finance could be one, of one or more the rules making, or that's another one, or global governance, whatever. And I really thank you joining us today for discussing about uh, innovation in policies. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. And thank you to the uh, Innovation for Coolers Forum to exist now for 10 years. That is really so important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I will, I will pass the floor to uh, Wu Changwa for moderating the first uh, plenary session, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Paquet and Mr. Tanaka. So now we will be moving on to a plenary session one, innovative policy making. First, I would like to introduce two moderators for the session, Ms. Jinghua Wu and Mr. Tanaka Nobuo. 
Ms. Shenghua Wu is ISAF Steering Committee, China Asia Director for Office of Jeremy Rifkin, co-founder of Professional Association for China's Environment, Chief Strategist of CN Innovation, Vice Chair of Governing Council, Asia Pacific Water Forum. And Mr. Tanaka Nobo is, as you can see, Chair of ISAF Steering Committee, former Executive Director of International Energy Agency. CEO of Tanaka Global Incorporated. <laughs> now I would like to ask Ms. Wu to moderate the session. Ms. Wu, if you please. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to carry on the second leg of this panel, uh, innovate, innovative policy making. Uh, thank you for Tanaka-san and also the ambassador uh, for setting the scene and also uh, offering this deep dive with the European sort of model. And uh, so we're going to carry on to bring five more, uh, I call it case studies, to deep dive further around the innovative policy making. Uh, so with that, I'm going to invite all my panel. Uh, I think we have four panelists actually uh, physically here and one online. So can I uh, kindly invite it, uh, my panelists actually on board? They are and uh, Ms. Akira Sakano, uh, Mr. Uh, Imai Masanori, uh, Dr. Evelyn Wong, uh, Mr. Ho Hing Lee, Coming to the stage, please. Thank you. While my colleagues are uh, getting ready to sit, I'm, the first speaker actually will be online. And uh, I'm going to, I get, is, is Ms. Maria online connected? So now we're going to start with the first uh, case study. And uh, so it's my honor and privilege to invite Ms. Maria Espinosa Fernanda uh, from Ecuador, uh, former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador and the, and the 73rd President of the United Nations General Assembly. She has been a very strong uh, international advocate for sustainable development, gender equality, and also global health, and a very strong voice for change and inclusion. And without further ado, uh, the space, the time is yours, Maria. I want to begin by thanking the organizers of this 10th annual edition of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, ICEF but also to thank the government of Japan for its commitment to a low carbon and just transition to sustainable development in a more peaceful and safe future for all. It is a privilege to be with you, even if I would have preferred to join in person. I would like to share some reflections about the need to close the gap between knowledge, policy, and practice. I would briefly provide an example of my home country, Ecuador, and close with some recommendations to improve our current governance designs, especially the institutional and policy frameworks for cleaner and climate-friendly economies. The world has a policy scaffold agreed by all 193 governments in 2015 called the Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs are the roadmap to build societies based on the triad people, planet, and prosperity by 2030. Last week in New York, we just had the midterm summit to assess progress on the SDGs, and regrettably, every report on progress state that the sustainable development goals are lagging behind with only about 12% of the roughly 140 targets on track. We have gone backward in the hard-won development gains in the last decade. We are also experiencing a profound triple planetary crisis, climate change, biodiversity, and pollution. Biodiversity loss and pollution are now widely recognized as existential environmental threats. According to the UN Global Landlock Assessment, 
more than 1 million species are now threatened with extinction, and 40% of the Earth land surfaces are considered degraded. Climate change is also having devastating effects on ecosystems and may soon require more adaptation than mitigation in order, uh, among others, to ensure continued availability of fresh water and food. The frequency of climate disasters such as heat waves, droughts and floods are rising, posing substantial threats to coastal communities. The lack of progress is universal. However, it disproportionately affects developing countries and the world's poorest and most vulnerable populations, leaving many countries of the South with limited resources to achieve the SDGs and meet the commitments of the Climate Paris Agreement. Poverty and inequalities are rising. Additionally, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showed that people who are already most vulnerable and marginalized are experiencing the greatest impacts of extreme weather events and global warming, thus creating new barriers to overcoming poverty. One of the most vulnerable groups are women and girls. The impact of climate change has a clear gender component. According to UN Women, 70% of the 1.3 billion people living in poverty are women. Around 50 to 80% of women are employed in the world's food production. However, they own less than 10% of the land. The most recent uh, gender snapshot report of 2023 projected that an additional 158.3 million women and girls could be propelled into pro poverty due to climate change by mid-century. At the international level, countries have already agreed on frameworks and pathways to address this planetary crisis. The 2015 Paris Agreement under the UN Convention on Climate Change has the goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2050 or the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework adopted in 2022. So all parties committing to setting national targets to implement this 30 by 30 target, which is the ambition to conserve 30% of the world's land and 30% of the ocean by 2030. However, for these efforts to be successful, it is imperative that they are translated into laws, policies, and programs that allocated the necessary resources and capacities for their implementations. Governments should reflect these agreements into domestic policies. Currently, there is what we call a significant implementation deficit. The question here is why, if we have the international legal frameworks, the knowledge, the technologies, the evidence of the high economic, social, and political costs of inaction, emissions continue to grow steadily, and the climate crisis is becoming increasingly out of hand. Why is that? Allow me to use the example of Ecuador, my country, uh, and that would show the structural hurdles that developing countries face while translating international law and policy into domestic efforts to a green and just transition. Ecuador is considered, considered one of the most biodiverse countries in the world due to the high diversity uh, of ecosystem species and cultures. In 2008, Ecuador became the first country to recognize the rights of nature in its constitution. The constitution acknowledges nature rights to exist, to flourish and evolve. And in the same way, a comprehensive national strategy for climate change was adopted from 20 to, uh, 2012 to 2025. Um, 80% of Ecuador's energy sources are renewable. So the overall outlook it looks promising. Ecuador, like uh, many oil exporting nations, has long depended on oil as a crucial source of revenue. In fact, its peak, uh, uh, at its peak, uh, oil accounted for approximately 40% of Ecuador's GDP. While oil exports have fueled some economic growth and development, oil has also exposed the nation to significant vulnerabilities and high environmental and social costs. But there's another crucial aspect, Ecuador's foreign debt and debt service. A significant portion of Ecuador's GDP is devoted to servicing its foreign debt. 
in recent years, it has averaged around 30% of the country's GDP. The substantial debt service has limited the government's ability to invest in climate adaptation and mitigation, or in essential public service, in infrastructure, and poverty reduction programs. The case of Ecuador is similar to many countries in the global south, where political will is not enough. There is a need for global solutions based on greater cooperation and solidarity. All countries must address the need to translate multilateral frameworks into domestic policymaking to accelerate the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. I would like to mention only three uh, that are critical to close this knowledge policy action gap. First, policy coherence. And for that to happen, we need a systemic approach, a whole of society, a whole of government approach to sustainable development. We cannot stabilize climate if we don't address poverty, inequalities, if we don't solve the food crisis or provide energy to the 775 million people or save drinking water to the 3.6 billion people. This requires policy coherence and the means to do it. So my second point is about means of implementation, including financial resources, low carbon technologies and capacity building. A, uh, this requires a debt restructuring package for the 61 countries in debt distress and the recapitalization of multilateral banks. Low and middle income countries require greater policy and fiscal space to deliver on their climate and sustainable development commitments. B, digital solutions that can accelerate 70% of the SDG targets. Technology can help us reduce our footprint and accelerate action on climate-related challenges, including agricultural aspects that are very relevant to guaranteeing food and to climate adaptation and mitigation. However, we must ensure that technology is also attainable in less developed countries. And three is investing in capacities in private and public sectors. And number three, recommendation is that we need a refreshed and more effective, responsive environmental governance for the ecological commons. This is absolutely critical. An example uh, would be the adoption a new, uh, of a new pact for the environment. Uh, the other uh, critical issue uh, in the particular case of climate change is that we need to improve accountability mechanisms and abide by the principle of common but differentiated mechanisms and responsibilities contained in the UN Climate Convention and reform the existing financial architecture, as mentioned before. I think we should not lose the impetus gained at the last SDG summit held two weeks ago in New York. Promises must be kept. For example, the newly adopted political declaration at the General Assembly. Uh, this declaration is a reaffirmation of the commitment to the SDGs, including uh, the SDG on climate change. This declaration advocates for substantial financial support for developing countries, including a minimum annual stimulus of high 500 billion and a more effective, effective debt relief mechanisms. We are at the halfway point with seven years to go to 2030, where we need to reduce emissions by 43% and correct the course of action on climate change. The forthcoming COP28 will be hopefully a milestone moment to align our efforts on climate action and set the basis for the summit of the future in 2024. This summit of the future next year is a one in a generation opportunity to accelerate the implementation of the outcomes agreed at the SDG summit. Through strong political will, wise and responsible leadership, informed by science, there is hope for a significant breakthrough to a brighter future. And the future starts today. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Uh, I particularly appreciate, we started to hear a little bit more voice actually from the South. So uh, I really, I like the, her summary, three recommendations, particularly around the policy coherence, means of implementation, as well as refresh the more responding, responsible 
uh, governance. I think that sort of re sort of representing more and more to the voice from the south. Now I'm going to move on to our second uh, case. Uh, presenter, Dr. Evelyn Wong, and she is the director of the Advanced Research Project Agency of Energy, and she's going to bring us more uh, from the U.S. perspective, particularly around uh, innovative technology. The floor is yours, Evelyn. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I am pleased to be here today with all of you, and it's also my honor and privilege to serve as director of ARPA-E. I've served in this role for about nine months, and prior to this, I was a faculty member and head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. I was also recipient of four awards or four grants from ARPA-E as a professor, which is why I'm so excited to be here in this role as director to serve in this agency. I know we all share goals to accelerate clean, sustainable, and viable energy technologies in the future for climate change and addressing the challenges with that. Together, our support for transformational energy solutions will benefit all of our nations. RPE supports high-risk, high-reward transformational energy projects to move them out of the lab and into the market. The projects that we support are developing entirely new ways to generate, store, and use energy. And specifically, our mission is to reduce imports, to improve energy efficiency, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve radioactive waste management, and improve the resiliency and reliability of our energy infrastructure. As a funding and technology agency, RPE supports disruptive, impactful energy technologies that lead to learning curves, new learning curves, and creating new markets. So RPE takes a portfolio-based approach, which means we fund a variety of technologies across a range of focused programs. And these programs cover everything from aviation to batteries to carbon capture and storage, methane emissions detection and mitigation, geologic hydrogen, and more. At RPE, we talk about mountains of opportunity for developing transformative energy technologies. RPE funds the first mountain, which is the early stage R&D needed to achieve lab scale prototypes. And more recently, we have also supported a second mountain in the middle, as you see here, which is a program called ScaleUp. And ScaleUp's focus is to help further mature these lab scale prototypes such that they can be sufficiently de-risked for the private sector to then invest and ultimately deploy these energy technologies at scale. So we were asked to talk about particular case studies. And RPE's role, in fact, is focused really on technology, and we don't make policy. But what I can do is offer an example of how our work in technology can influence and inform policy. An example I'd like to share with you today is from our program called DAYS. All of our programs at RPE have acronyms. And so this one stands for Duration Addition to Electricity Storage. So RPE created DAYS to define what it means to have long duration energy storage, or LDES, to say this is what long duration energy storage looks like. At the time, LDES was not defined in policy. For every RPE program, we figure out what state of the art is and clearly define metrics. Through days, 
ARPA-E defined state-of-the-art LDES as capable of providing power to the electric grid for durations of 10 to approximately 100 hours and requiring a lifetime of 20 years. After many conversations and congressional briefings, the parameters that we put forth in the day's program made it into law. And for the first time, LDES was defined in law as providing power for 10 to approximately 100 hours. But beyond making it into law, I'll give you two examples of the kinds of technologies funded under DAES. One example is a company on the left called Quidnet Energy. Quidnet is based in Houston, Texas, and they are developing a geomechanical pumped storage system. So in contrast to pumped hydro, which requires elevations to drive the, the storage system, what Quinnet does is they take advantage of the excess renewables and now store it in the context of pressurized water in the subsurface. And so stored can be up to about 10 plus hours in modules of one to 10 megawatts. And when you need the energy, you release the valve and then the pressurized water is then used to drive a turbine. What's exciting about Quidnet is not only have they engaged various investors, is that they now have engaged with CPS Energy, the largest community-owned provider of electric, electric and natural gas services in the US. And they announced a 15-year commercial agreement for a project with their geomechanical pump storage. The, another example is what you see on the right, which is Antora Energy based in Sunnyvale, California. And what they're developing is a thermal battery where they take advantage of heated carbon blocks that, that go up to temperatures close to 2,000 degrees Celsius. So it's glowing hot to store the energy. And in fact, when they need to now garner the electricity, they take advantage of a thermal, photo, thermal photovoltaic cell that's highly efficient to then convert this thermal energy back into electricity. Their energy storage system is capable of 12 megawatt hours of energy storage for 25 hours. And now they've demonstrated or are demonstrating their first commercial pilot in Fresno, California. Another way that ARPA-E technology informs the policy discussion is by bringing industry into the conversation. And to illustrate this, I'll tell you about another program that we launched called Monitor. When Monitor was launched in 2014, continuous or semi-continuous methane monitoring was cost prohibitive. And at that time, high resolution methane measurement approaches had initial capital costs of about $75,000 to $100,000 in addition to installation, calibration, and operating costs, yielding an annual measurement cost more than $25,000 per site. Monitor's objective was to detect and measure methane leaks as small as one ton per year from a site of 10 meters by 10 meters in area with a certainty that would allow 90% reduction in methane loss for annual site cost of $3,000. By reducing costs and increasing accuracy, the Monitor program created a viable technology option which enabled industry and policymakers to discuss real solutions. And in fact, an oil and gas industry representative said in a congressional hearing that ARPA-E put a marker in the ground for industry and policymakers. Beyond getting in front of policymakers, now there are two companies that we have supported that have su suggested that in fact, 
methane emission detection is possible and can be deployed at scale. The example on the left is a company called Long Path Technologies. They developed a dual frequency comb spectrometer capable of detecting and quantifying more than 90% of leaks down to 0.2 kilograms per hour from a distance of nearly one mile. Last year, Long Path raised about $30 million in Series A funding. And today, this company serves 16 customers with applications across other sectors, including waste and mining as well. On the right is a company called Bridger Photonics, and they're developing a gas mapping LIDAR sensor, which attaches to an aircraft for aerial scans, which is capable of using a broad range frequency swept laser to detect and precisely locate and accurately quantify methane emissions across entire natural gas value chain. And in 2021, Southern California gas company signed a $12 million agreement with Bridger to use their technology to detect, pinpoint, and quantify methane emissions through their SoCal gas distribution area. In addition, Bridger has also raised a $55 million round in Series B. So before I move on from the panel, I'll just quickly talk about a few of the aspects of areas of technology that we're interested in pursuing moving forward. We see there are significant opportunities as we improve energy density of batteries, 4X, for heavy duty transport. We're also interested in using renewables to create liquid fuels, such as that of sustainable, sustainable aviation fuels. We know battery circularity will be more critical as we now tackle climate change and now the waste associated with all the technologies that we're developing. And so we're interested in now looking at how we can really achieve battery circularity, whereby we want to look at how we reuse, how do we really manufacture batteries, and using recycling as a last resort. And finally, of course, we want to always push the boundaries of opportunities for energy generation and clean energy sources. And so we are ex always excited about continuing to help make commercial fusion a reality. So I'll close by saying that this is a time, I know this discussion is focused on policy, but it's an all hands on deck moment where we need to work with the policymakers, the technologists, the researchers, the academics, the investors, all of us have a role to work together to be able to create a clean, sustainable energy future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. And uh, it just reminded me, I think Michael uh, Mann, in this recent book, actually, Our Future Time, he, he's talked about how do we keep the 1.5 degrees actually still feasible. He mentioned something, actually, addressing the climate crisis is not a technology challenge, that's for sure, right? And so even though it's a challenging, but innovative policymaking is the interface to get all the pieces together, so that will be really able to make the right decision and the effective the decision actually moving forward. To save the time, I'm going to just carry on for the other, uh, you know, uh, presenters there. Uh, in the meantime, to remind both the audience here and also participants online to send, you know, getting ready for your questions or you can submit it online so we'll be able to capture some of your questions actually into the discussion later. Now, I'm going to move to uh, Ms. Aki Akira Sakano. She's the founder and director of Zero Waste Japan. She's also co-founder, Green Innovation, director and CSO, Ecomet Company Limited. And she's going to talk about waste, circular economy. The floor is yours, Akira. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, but I also feel like myself being quite the disruptor here because my background is basically working with communities to achieve zero waste society. And then, you know, everyone talks about high level, a very global scale, but at the same time, I'm really coming from very micro scale change making. So um, 
let me get into a little bit of the background. So as you might all know that the waste problem is still growing compared to uh, back in 2016. By 2050, uh, the global waste is expected to grow by 70%. So this is already a big problem. At the same time, you can already imagine that when we are creating waste, which means we are also using resources. So Mr. Noguchi mentioned in the, the keynote that you know, we are one earth and then the earth is limited. But our uh, consumption of resources is growing rapidly every year. At the same time, we are not catching up with uh, sufficient infrastructure building in terms of how to circulate it, which means circular rate is actually declining every year, sadly. So um, when we look at how to make then circular society or circular economy, this is a face, uh, famous diagram by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, well, everything needs to circulate, yes. But at the same time, also, I'd like to highlight today that um, the key point of this diagram is the smaller the circular is, the better. So that's why I myself has been working at Zero Waste Japan with communities or, or municipal uh, governments or local governments in Japan to actually create one and one, uh, one, one step by one uh, very small cases uh, how to achieve zero waste. So one famous example for my background is a community called Kamikatsu in Tokushima Prefecture. Uh, this was famous for the first municipal government in Japan to declare for the zero waste ambition back in 2003. Uh, this is also famous for its actual achievement for diverting 80% of its waste going to incineration. So average Japan's waste is still around 20% uh, for recycling rate, but uh, Kamikatsu was actually showing that you know, if you do something <laughs> properly, then you can actually achieve something. So uh, with that background, um, I really wanted to showcase how this example could be uh, multi multiplied or you know, copied by other communities. Well, Kamikaze is famous for also very detailed segregation categories of waste. It actually have official 45 categories of waste segregation, which is massive, and I don't think everyone needs to copy that. But at the same time, each community or each region has its uniqueness. So meaning we can actually build different uh, solutions based on what we have. So for example, I started working with Unnan city, which is in the Shimane prefecture in Japan. Um, we, we partner with community organization there, started kind of building compost in different community centers. So within only in two months, so which means less than you know, 60 days, we built more than 70 composts. So meaning one, one compost, more than one compost per day. And then we monitored how citizens could uh, contact or utilize the compost in different communities level. Then we actually consolidated the data and then uh, shared that data with the municipal government. So right now they are focusing on supporting communities, not just building big facilities, but supporting community to actually accelerate uh, their policy in terms of waste reduction. Or other communities in Nagano, it's called Obuse Town in Nagano Prefecture. That region is famous for, uh, for example, apple trees, um, then chestnut trees, grapes. Right now is the season, so if you have time, please enjoy these fruits and nuts as well. But anyway, uh, you can see in the middle of the, the slice, the black um, kind of fluffy uh, picture in the middle. Uh, I hope you can guess what it is. But this is a chestnut shell, and then we made it into charcoal. So um, actually, this region is again famous these uh, branches, these agricultural byproducts, and then uh, they were just burning it before. And then we wanted to uh, utilize that as uh, well. One, of course, to refertilize the agricultural land at the same time to utilize these resources as a biomass energy sources in the region. So right now uh, we are also eyeing, for example, for the uh, credit scheme because once we utilize, uh, for example, this chestnut shell to be uh, made into the charcoal, then if we put into the soil, it's actually the carbon capture as well. So something like that. So uh, in this region, people have more mindset or you know, connection with these products. So that's why it's an entrance point for the citizens to be connected with environmental topics, uh, decarbonization topic, and also zero waste uh, topic as well. 
So uh, that's some of the examples that I've been working with. But at the same time, connecting small dots in different regions also very much a key as well. So right now, I last year, we partnered with different organizations to start up a new platform to pitching for uh, non-incineration for biodegradable waste by 2030 in Japan. So this is very much a challenge. As I said, right now, only 20% of the resources here in Japan is recycled. 80% uh, is going to re-incineration. And within that 80%, actually from the household waste, uh, around 40% is organic waste. So basically we are burning uh, watery-based organic waste as a general condition. And then if we could actually reduce that going to incineration, we can actually save much of the uh, fuel as well in terms of to support the incineration. So that's why uh, we are connecting right now uh, various organizations in the small grassroots level in all over Japan to kind of share the knowledge, but at the same time uh, getting or gathering the data. So we are building up the data from different organizations all over Japan and then showcase that, okay, how much organic, organic waste they are diverting from going to incineration? What's the impact of that uh, for day-to-day day -day life for the citizens? And uh, how, what, what is the critical uh, challenges they, they are facing in terms of uh, expanding that uh, compost in their own communities? So we are building that data, and then we started communicating with, for example, Ministry of Agriculture, who are now focusing also on the organic farming and then to uh, make sure that we have enough uh, fertilizers supply in Japan, considering the current global issues. At the same time, we are also communicating with, well, yes, different municipalities to implement not only community-based compost, but also to support that system by subsidizing, or in, in bigger case, of course, we need to build bigger facility to support more engagement for the uh, bigger populations. So that's what we do. But at the same time, I'd like to also highlight, uh, I said myself as kind of disruptor in this session, and I think that's very important in every, every situation in the society. So in Japanese, in Japanese saying, uh, when we have to, or when we want to create some change in the community, we always need someone coming from outside, someone very young, or someone foolish. So foolish is a strong word, but basic, basically, you know, creating idea always need disruption, right? So that's why um, I really appreciate tomorrow's session, who we invite young, uh, young people, young professionals, and then uh, one of the speaker will be there, is actually part of our program called Green Innovator Academy. So we founded this program, Green Innovator Academy, one, uh, two years ago almost, and then now we are educating young students and young professionals uh, over six months program. They commit every Saturday throughout the six months. And then they learn about how to uh, deliver uh, decolonization ideas, how to actually deliver innovative ideas in the society. And then that's why um, we think that Disruption creation at the same time facilitation is very important. So we also deliver facilitation skill sets for these young professionals. And after the courses, of course, some of them goes back to their own organization. But we are also uh, providing opportunity for them to get into rural communities or small communities that, for example, I work for, and then so that they can actually uh, practice and then actually deliver impacts in the community. So as I mentioned, 70 compost in Unnan City actually that was made by these young students who learned after six months, they're actually getting into the, the community and then now they are actually leading their, the, the policy creation in the Unnan City. So for example, uh, that's some of the, uh, the example I wanted to really share that small dots is very important, creating small circles is important, but at the same time, I'd like everyone to think here that how to connect these dots to be uh, accelerated in the global scale as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akira. Uh, that's very inspiring. I think a couple of pieces there. One, uh, a lot of local governments actually made the commitment to net zero, uh, either zero carbon or zero waste. And particularly through the local planning process, so you have the vehicle agency actually to participate in that process. As you said, very important is this bottom-up, you know, bring inside outsiders together there. While I was reading the materials last night actually to prepare for today's discussion, I started thinking about it. even within my, you know, professional network, I can connect you with the colleagues in London, in China, whatever. A lot of people are already doing that. So this is a global effort there as well. So th congratulations and thank you very much. Uh, next, I'm going to 
to move on to Mr. Imai Masanori. He's a church person and representative director of Toda Corporation, co-chair Japan Climate Leadership Partnership, as well as vice president, National, uh, National G General Contractors Association of Japan. He's going to bring us the case study of the renewable energy and uh, I think particularly the floating offshore wind energy. The floor is yours, Mr. Hi. Uh, Thank you very much. I am Imai. I'm from to Toda Corporation the, for the development of the, the construction industry and also for the climate change. I have been working uh, actively today. Thank you very much for this the opportunity. I'd like to share with you the renewable energy use and challenges that we uh, try to share. Please take a look at this. This shows the comparison of the, the general government debt, and the, we are the, having the, 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 the funding of 20 trillion yen. So it, it, it makes sense to reverse the situation of the debt, and at the same time, we are able to, work to uh, drive Japanese economy's growth. This shows the number of the uh, number of workers in Japan, and it is declining. It is important to raise the level of the, uh, the, uh, the GDP, and for this, it is important to improve the uh, work style, operational efficiency, and productivity. And also at the same time, it is important to provide the contribution for the for high, highly productive industries that would contribute to the carbon neutrality. And these are the proposals we, that we can make for to solve the problems in Japan. The Japan's wind resources have a potential of about 1.8 times its energy demand. By improving the energy balance and the stability, we are able to make a contribution to the energy security. Furthermore, to be more specific, the, we, ha we don't have the shallow waters, so in many ways, uh, the wind resources are located in the uh, EZ, so it means that we need to have the floating, the floating offshore wind power, and the offshore wind, uh, wind power can be mass produced, installed, and it, it can be a main source of primary energy. Uh, but the, uh, it is important to build large-scale industries with high productivity and establish energy security. In 2050, when we have the carbon neutrality, this is a situation that we can imagine. The, we have to share the future design with all the members in Japan so that all the members of the public and private would work hand in hand. And this is a green energy world. About, we are utilizing the one third of the, uh, the wind power so that we are able to cover 50% of the total energy. So it, it, we are able to produce 18, 18 trillion yen worth of industry scale with the calculation of the 7 yen per kilowatt. However, having said that, there are many challenge that, challenges that we are faced with. The first is the difficulty of acquisition of large-sized wind power generators. We don't uh, produce it. In order to utilize EZ, the, it is important to have the mega floating, the mega floating, the offshore wind power. So it is important to establish the uh, offshore, ex the expanded wind power floating complex. And also, it is important to have the uh, infrastructure for the, uh, for the, the uh, trans uh, transmission lines, power grids and ports, and fisheries and promotion and biodiversity is important. I'd like to skip this. And as can be seen, it is becoming larger and larger. And these are there are three largest manufacturers, but Chinese manufacturers are gaining momentum. In the case of the the solar panel, there could be some consolidation of the industry. In Japan, we have the, the it is important to have the low cost the production of the generators that can be can be realized or produced in Japan within the EZ offshore, 
the, we have to have a mega float as in floating or the floating complex as the infrastructure that would support the situation. This can be used in various uh, areas, and this can be used also for the emergency risk, uh, emergency relief operations. So this can be used for the the, the uh, prevention of the deterioration of biodiversity and others. So in order to do this, it is important to have a discussion of all the members so that we are able to establish a rule that can be convinced everybody for the large scale the production, the open the planning process is important for the entire process. It takes time. So it, it makes sense to have a top down process. This is the example of EU. They have uh, the concrete uh, plans for that. And it, with this kind of a plan, it is possible for each player to work on their initiation of their projects. This is what we started in the, 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 the uh, designing in 2017 in Goto, the island. We have been working on it. So it takes time, 10 or 20, 20 years, for the realization of the commercialization from the, the beginning of the design to the actual use. And this is what we are using as the uh, float, floating offshore wind. In order to establish the new the uh, offshore wind, we establish a new system. So uh, we established the, uh, the joint research center for the offshore wind system integration. We sincerely hope that we'll be able to establish this. This is the introduction of this. We have a QR code, so we'd like you to take a look at the joint research center for the offshore wind system integration. Apollo project was established by the President Kennedy, and the President Kennedy made clear that there is a high level of quit commitment by the U.S. government. That was a driving force for the success. And so the, I do believe that this should be the, the uh, Apollo project in Japan for 2050. 2050 might, not, might be too late, but it is important to have the clear goal with the clear timeline to be shared by all the members. And the taking on the challenge would certainly vitalize Japanese economy and Japanese industry. And also, this would make a contribution to the Japanese security system. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Masanori, and uh, definitely uh, you shared with us the capability from corporate sector, from the construction, building, designing, planning, uh, engineering there as well. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, last but not least, and I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Henry Lee, and he's the founder and CEO of Volta Air Mobility, and uh, he's going to bring to us another very innovative uh, innovation, every technology as well. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, my name is Henry Hui, and I'm the founding chairman of Vola Air Mobility a Hong Kong-based green aviation company aiming to promote the adoption of environmentally responsible traveling alternatives. It's truly an honor to stand here, or well, to, to be here, to discuss a topic of utmost importance, uh, innovative policy making in support of green transition. Uh, climate change is real, and one of humankind's most challenging issues. According to World Bank, 80% of the Maldives and major glaciers across the world, including that of Mount Kilimanjaro, will disappear by 2050. The recent surge in energy prices, such as the 40% jump in European gas prices in August, and geopolitical, geopolitical tensions pose another significant challenge to our transition towards green developments and sustainability. The situation calls for an urgent attention and effective strategies and policies to ensure energy security and supply chain stability. Oops. Uh, sorry. The government's role in ensuring an appropriate mix of operational and policy measure is crucial in reducing the risk of uncertainty and volatility in the global economy and geopolitics. By creating an enabling environment through the acronym IDR, fostering international collaboration and multilateral partnerships, diversifying of energy mix sources and policies, 
and developing resilient energy infrastructure, we can significantly address and in some, in some cases mitigate the adverse effects from the energy crisis, including geopolitical tension. Through proactive measures to ensure energy security, countries can effectively reduce their vulnerability and promote stability in the global energy landscape, contributing to a more secure and harmonious world. Taking each of the IDR initiative in turn, I, international collaboration and partnerships. International cooperation, as I think uh, Ambassador Parquet so spoke about today, is key in effectively addressing and managing geopolitical challenges surrounding energy security. Through collaborative agreements, countries can collectively tackle these issues. One effective approach is the establishment of shared green infrastructure projects, such as logistic transportation network, transmission grids and pipelines that connect energy producing regions with consumer markets. This cooperation allows countries to pull their resources and expertise, bolstering the resilience of critical energy infrastructure. More importantly, this can unlock economies of scale and enhance technological advancements, driving down cost and making clean energy more accessible and affordable for all. Moreover, by fostering dialogue and collaboration, countries can work towards mutually beneficial solutions. This can involve negotiating long-term supply agreements, ensuring fair pricing uh, mechanisms, energy sustainability, and promoting transparency in energy markets. Through these partnerships, trust and corporations can be built, leading to more stable energy partnerships and the reduction of geopolitical risk. Nations can leverage their respective strengths and resources to overcome common challenges and accelerate progress towards sustainable energy systems. If we turn our attention to the aviation sector, in the context of IDR, we can draw upon innovative responses to these challenges. At the recent uh, General Assembly uh, in October 2022, the International Civil Aviation Organization adopted the Long-Term Aspirational Goals, LTAG in short, of achieving net zero carbon emission by 2050. This agreement goes beyond endorsing the aviation industry's green ambition, as it allows countries to decarbonize at different speeds according to national circumstances while operating within a common global framework. Such international collaboration enables the aviation sector to address climate changes effectively and ensuring a sustainable future for air travel. Further evidence comes from the UK Civil Aviation Authority so Stephen Hillier, the chairman of the regulator, emphasized the need for co global common standards in flying taxi regulations. This is vital to ensure uniformity and to avoid divergent regulations that will hinder the widespread adoption of pioneering green air taxi, potentially a new sustainable way to travel. Further, Boeing announced last year the establishment of a research and development center here in partnership with the Japanese Ministry for Economy, Trade and Industry. The center focuses on areas such as sustainable aviation fuel, uh, fuel SAF, robotics, et cetera, for the aviation industry. Such cross-border partnerships is instrumental in expediting the adoption of sustainable practices and technologies. Next, uh, D, uh, diversifying energy sources and policies. The significance of international cooperation also lies in its contribution towards the diversification of energy sources, another important measure in mitigating geopolitical risk. Cross-border energy trade and research partnerships accelerate the expansion and innovation of diverse energy technologies. Diversification of green transition policies reduce dependence on a single energy source or supplier, mitigating the risk of geopolitical tensions. By promoting diverse mix of renewable energy sources, such as hydro, wind, and power, countries can decrease their reliance on fossil fuels and imported energy. This reduces vulnerability to disruptions arising from political conflicts, trade disputes, or shifts in energy, global energy markets. Moreover, distributed renewable energy system enhance energy security as they are less susceptible to large-scale disruption. 
By diversifying green transition policies, countries can strengthen their energy independence and mitigate geopolitical risk. For green aviation, diversifying energy sources for aviation is crucial. So reliance on fossil fuels for aviation adds to the problem of climate change, price volatility, and geopolitical tensions. The adoption of SAF is a key solution to reducing tension, re reducing reliance on fossil fuel imports, and enables countries to establish energy security policies to developing sustainable and diversified energy sources. Investing in new energy aircraft technologies further enhances energy security by decreasing dependence on finite fossil fuels. In embracing sustainable alternatives, the aviation industry can contribute to a more resilient and environmentally friendly future. R, developing resilient energy infrastructure. To maximize the benefits of diversification strategy, governments should prioritize the development of robust energy infrastructure. Governments can play a crucial role in facilitating this by providing support in the form of funding, incentives, et cetera, for development of renewable energy generation capacity, smart grids, and storage system. This will promote a more secure and reliable energy supply and minimizing disruptions. In doing so, countries can establish a resilient energy infrastructure. An excellent illustration of, uh, is the rollout of the H2 hub airport initiative, which aims to transport airports into hydrogen hubs in France. This initiative focuses on developing the entire hydrogen value chain within airports. Thus, in the short term, paving the way for the introduction of hydrogen at airports, and in the longer term, operation of liquid powered high aircraft, liquid hydrogen powered aircraft. Critically, blending these strategies into long-term develop, national development policy with effective execution is important. A consistent policy framework provides clarity, stability, and certainty, which are essential for attracting investments, fostering innovation, and driving long-term growth in the green sector. The Nordic countries are exemplary in their approach towards green transition. Their commitment to renewable energy sources, sustainable practices, and circular economy principles serves as a model for other nations. Each country has its own national policies and strategies towards reducing emission. This is augmented by extensive collaboration and integration, specifically in the energy sector with a highly interconnected electricity market. This lends itself to efficient energy transfer and utilization with enhanced security and resilience. As energy mix evolves, continuous learning, best practice, and knowledge sharing will enable the Nordic countries to innovate and overcome the challenges in going green. Their success will reinforce the importance of collaboration and commitment to long-term national policy in achieving a sustainable and green economy. In conclusion, it's crucial to adopt innovative policies to reduce geopolitical tensions to, for green transitions. These policies should blend in multilateral partnerships, diversification of energy sources, and the development of resilient energy infrastructure. In embracing such forward-thinking strategies, countries can enhance energy security and minimize frictions as they transition towards greener energy systems. Ultimately, these measures enable nations to address the challenges inherent in green transition and paving the way for a sustainable and prosperous future for all. As advocates of public interest capitalism, inspired by Ambassador George Harris Alliance Forum Foundation, we at VOLA strongly encourage everyone to work together towards a shared goal of building a sustainable future that delivers impactful societal advantages. In closing, we would like to leave you with this um, proverb, Amadare Ishu o Ugatsu, which literally translates to constant dripping wears away the stone. Simply said, while the work ahead may seem challenging, collective efforts will eventually be impactful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh
I know sort of I've been reminded of running uh, out of the time already, but with the special permission from our chair, so we're going to extend it a little bit because I feel like, of course, listening through presentations, we all learn a lot, actually, particularly from the presenters here. But without the interaction, that's going to be really a regret. So I don't want to leave much regret. I wish we had more time. So. Within the time limited, extended time, what I'm going to do as moderator, I made a decision. I'm going to entertain our audience here in the room two questions, very important questions, and then the last word actually to my, uh, you know, our our chair, but also my uh, co-moderator of this uh, session, uh, Tanaka San, there as well. So can I see quickly two hands? Okay, please. You don't want to waste the time. Do I see any? Yes, please. Uh, can I give you the mic? Behind you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to direct my question to Akira Sang. Uh, looking from your your perspective, would be uh, what what is the the better option to do it? Uh, down a policy or bottom-up policy like you are doing right now. Uh, who are you? <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Um, Parita Panduwenyong from Thailand. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, one more question. Just wait to stop like that. One more. Just one more. Okay, I see another hand there, please. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Hirose from Highwells. So I did a question to the uh, uh, speak about the importance of the infrastructure for the people to get, uh, we are talking about the innovation of the each technology but also we need uh, the innovation for building a new infrastructure like uh, uh, the, uh, the Toda said uh, how we make a vision for the 2050 and from that we need the uh, infrastructure for delivering the low, energy, uh, low carbon energy for each home, each house, each factory. Uh, these are missing in this current discussion. Okay, absolutely. Thank you so much for the two gentlemen, Ashri, for using the time. Now, Akira, please. Yes, thank you very much for the, the question. I would respond, we need really both. <laughs> so the point is, uh, we always need to have bottom up, and then that's very important in terms of engagement or long-term sustainable uh, action implemented. But at the same time, uh, for example, in the case of kamikaze, just to give an example, let's say we achieved 80% diversion, but at the same time, rest of the 20%, can we achieve it by ourselves? No. We really need the policy to, for example, top down to maybe ban some material or like at least implement new technology to make sure everything can be recyclable or something else. So otherwise, we can't really achieve like 100% or net zero or any kind of high level target. Uh, so that's why I think that we need both. At the same time, when we setting the, the top down policy making, at the same time, we always need to consider that what's already existing in the bottom. So we can utilize what's already existing in the society. So that's why we, we don't you know, fight there, but to engage everyone to make things happen. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Akira. Uh, Mr. Masanori-san, would you like to respond to the question around the infrastructure. Thank you. Hi. Uh, uh, future design uh, 2050 and a backcasting from that target of 2050 by when, what has to be done. I think that has to be considered and we have to take on the challenge of doing that. So be it hydrogen or anything else. As you know, uh, there are technological elements uh, that are needed, and uh, many of them are there already, available. But um, we are not making advancement putting together those technological elements. That's why we need to have a common target that can be shared by everyone. We have to come up with such challenge involving everyone. And the government has to come up with such a vision and towards that vision, technologies that are possessed by a variety of companies that need to be put together, or also corporations them, themselves need to uh, transform. And towards that end, we have to create a new industry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I want to thank the panelists, actually. And, uh, 
I don't know, uh, maybe we share the feeling. Uh, when the ambassador presented the two cartoons there, that really struck me. Actually, I saw that yesterday, so I saw that before you, you know, as a moderator, I had the privilege. I'm hoping somehow today's session, uh, the innovative policy making session, really helps to address that gap, right? In reality, uh, we are not really those that's wild, the cats mooing at each other, whatever. So we are really coming together. So there, there's so much hope, particularly through the cases actually presented today. I think we had us all together, actually six. We had the ambassador presenting EU, uh, Maria presenting Ecuador, and then four panelists here in the audience and sharing their experience. Uh, you know, I, hopefully somehow you would conclude with me if not exactly the same conclusion, actually similar. I, you know, thank you for giving me this sense of hope. And now I'm going to pass the mic to my co-moderator and uh, to have the final words for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Changwa. Um, I am very much delighted to have you moderate the session and see many very strong women leaders in, in, in this uh, say session. Um, and also important elements is that uh, I met Changwa in, in a discussion of the UN uh, talking about the uh, modification of clean development pr program some time ago. Uh, Sakane-san is a leader of ISEC uh, in, in Mongolia and, uh, as a Japanese. Um, and Maria is, is a UN uh, General Assembly chairman and trying to change the system. So the, either in government or bottom up uh, from Sakane-san or in the business like Toda-san, we need a strong personnel who has a global identity. I mean, this issue of climate change is very global in nature. So nationalism or populism cannot solve this issue. So we need in the government, in the business, in the academics, uh, we definitely need those personnel, and I really see are very happy to see the very good examples uh, here as a model for the change in the future. Thank you very much for the participants, and I wish you the best luck continuously in this area. Thank you.